because our next session is all about Gen Z and uh, is presented by Gen Youth, which is PR Week's purpose partner. Um, I, we told you yesterday about how we wanted to walk the walk as well as talk it, so we uh, teamed up with Gen Youth to uh, donate food carts to schools in Chicago, and we did one yesterday morning. It was a fantastic morning and one of my favorite parts of the day, actually. Um, so what I want to do, is, the, the topic for this is influencing the now and next generation how to harness the domino effect of Gen Z. It's going to be moderated by Alexis Glick, who's CEO of Gen Youth. And joining her is Andrew Carlton, a senior at Kosaskum High School in Wisconsin. Sorry if I butchered that name. Susan Oguche, who's senior director of communications and CSR and PR at Sleep Number. And Michael Pankowski, a student at Harvard University and founder of the Crimson Connection. So welcome to the stage, Alexis and panel, to set this one up. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Good afternoon. All right, panelists, you guys, um, well, as you're making your way up with the um, microphones, feel free to come sit down. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for um, having us. And Steve, thank you so much. We feel so honored um, and humbled to be PR Week's uh, charitable partner uh, for this year's conference. And uh, one of the things that I can tell you after having spent the last decade in philanthropy, after having been in the business and the media world, is we want to partner with people who practice what they preach. And, uh, and the folks at, uh, at PR Week joined us in a local school just yesterday for us to deliver a breakfast cart to food insecure youth in the south side of Chicago for two high schools. And 15 of the team members here at PR Week joined us to do that. And so um, a round of applause to them for really caring about this next generation. So, um, so just briefly, before we dive into the panel, I just want to share with you briefly who Gen Youth is and kind of what our why is and uh, why we recommended doing this panel together. Uh, we are, we are uh, if you look at uh, those in the philanthropy world, we are the largest health and wellness program in schools in the United States in which we reach upwards of 40 million kids a day in about 75,000 of our nation's schools. Our focus is really on ensuring our why um, is that we're creating healthier school communities. And the way we do that is by lifting the voice of the key constituent, and that is the student. We believe that students are not the leaders of tomorrow. They are the leaders of today. And so what we focus on is how do we make them uh, make their voice louder? Uh, and how do we give them what we call the time, talent, and treasure, the resources that they need to succeed, whether that's access to a healthy meal for the 13 million kids who are food in insecure in the United States, or that's ensuring that they get access to the physical activity resources that they need to thrive and succeed. Um, I'll just briefly share with you a couple of statistics that um, usually rattle folks to the core. Many of us in this room grew up with something called PE or gym. Uh, in today's environment, at the elementary school level, if you look at uh, elementary, middle, and high school level, only 3% of elementary school kids, 8% of middle school kids, and 4% of high school age kids have any form of PE, daily PE. So our kids are essentially sedentary. Uh, add to that, as I shared with you just a moment ago, that if you look at our school system, there's about 50 million kids who attend school through United, throughout the United States. About 13 million of those kids are food insecure, which means they don't know where they're going to get their next meal. Without the meal in the school building, they go hungry. And that's in the United States of America. So our true north is how do we make sure we create a healthier school community? How do we make sure we give them the resources that they need so the kids can thrive and succeed? And how do we continue to uplift and empower the youth voice? The other quick thing I'll just mention is um, since a big chunk of my background comes from uh, the business world, I spent a decade in my career in Wall Street and then a little less than a decade in my career in media. When, uh, when we first started this philanthropy, I was uh, called into an office by Richard Edelman to meet with some folks. And he said, Alexis, I, I want you to do something that has a public policy bend to it. And I'm like, all right, Richard, well, what do you have in mind? He said, well, there's some folks, they're kind of unlikely suspects, but they want to do something about this next generation. And those unlikely suspects happen to be America's dairy farmers partnering with the National Football League. So some of you who are football fans may recognize something called Play 60 on football fields across the United States or all 32 teams. That is us. Uh, that's essentially a program that we run in schools, and we do that in partnership with the National Football League, all 32 teams, players, and America's dairy farmers. 
Why do I tell you that? Because they are the most unlikely of suspects who have decided to partner together to invest in this next generation. And so I was at a meeting a little bit earlier where we were talking about the importance of influencer marketing. And I was telling them briefly how the most unbelievable experience we've had is bringing a farmer and a player into a school building to talk to kids about the importance of leading a healthy lifestyle where your food comes from, what does it mean to be active on and off the field and to really practice what you preach as a player because what you do off the field is as important as what you do on the field. The one other thing I would just say is when we started this, I said to Richard, okay, we'll, we'll go build this and we're gonna, we're gonna tell this story and we'll create a movement, but if we're gonna go do it, uh, I said to the commissioner of the NFL and our chairman, we're gonna run it like a business because I had spent so much time in my career in the business community that I recognized that the only way for us to really achieve success is to make sure that we didn't act like a not-for-profit. And it doesn't mean that not-for-profits aren't wildly successful. Some of the most successful um, in the country are right here in your backyard. But if we thought and acted like a business, how might that change who we're able to bring to the table and why? How might we align ourselves with large multinational corporations where we can partially help tell their story mm -hmm. and they can be our third party accreditation and vice versa? So I think you'll see in some of the tactics and conversations that we have here today, that's a big part of who we are and it's a big part of the reason why we've been able to align with a lot of very, very large companies. But the most important thing that you're going to hear from this incredible panel is directly from students. Everyone's talking about Gen Zers. Let me just give you one quote before I dive into the panel. One of our students said uh, to us as we were coming out of a recent survey uh, about technology and its influence on health and wellness, and one of the students said at this event, if it's about me, don't do it without me. And I share that with you simply because what this generation is saying is, don't direct and create something or create a product or a solution that's for a certain cohort or certain demographic and then edit it for them. Bring them in to the creation process from inception. That's what students are telling us. I'm gonna let you hear directly from the experts. So if we could just with the panel, uh, each of you introduce yourselves and we'll dive in. Hi, I'm Michael Pankowski. I'm a sophomore at Harvard and head of Crimson Connection, a Generation Z uh, marketing consulting firm uh, run by me and my friends out of my dorm. Um, I don't speak. <laughs> I don't speak as well as Ms. Glick does, but I'll, I'll try my best. Um, I also write. I'm a contributing writer for Ad Age, PR Week. I'm looking to do more speaking. Um, I run the firm. I'm also a full-time student, uh, so you know I, I try to sleep. I drink a lot of coffee and have fun. Hi, I'm, I'm Andrew Carlton. I'm a senior at Kewaskum High School. Um, I know and know of you. I know um, nobody knows where that is, so it's about 45 minutes north of Milwaukee in Wisconsin. Um, I'm a big, I'm an avid golfer. I love golf. Um, I love um, just being outdoors, and I look to study communications um, when I go on to college. Hello, I'm Susan Aguche. I'm the senior director of um, communications at Sleep Number, and I'm so thrilled to be here today because Sleep Number is a purpose-driven company, um, and we have these type of conversations that we've been having throughout this day every single day at our company. So really delighted to be part of this conversation and share some of the work we've been doing with Gen Youth. Fantastic. All right, Michael, I'm, I'm going to jump in with you because when I first had the conversation with Michael, I'm like, okay, he's a real underachiever. Uh, but his freshman year, freshman year of college at Harvard, he decides he's going to create something called the Crimson Connection. Uh, so if you could just share with folks in the room, why did you decide to create it? Um, and ultimately, how did good brand strategies or bad ones influence your decision making? Yes, yeah, so first of all, I needed something to do. Uh, no, but um, oh, what did I do this for? Well, I believe students needed to be a bigger part of the conversation here. Gen Z is such a big demographic here. We're like, um, we're about to be the biggest generation next year in 2020. We'll be the biggest generation. We're also, we have $40 billion of spending power. So a huge generation that doesn't get talked about enough or talked to enough. So I believe that we needed a, uh, to be a bigger part of the conversation. Now, talking good brands, talking bad brands. A good brand, Patagonia, okay? So their thing is about environmentalism, about fighting climate change. Now, everybody's fighting climate change these days. Everybody's environmentalist. How do you separate yourself? Um, and including Gen Z, 70% of us say climate change is a problem. So again, mm -hmm. how do you separate yourself? 
Well, uh, for Patagonia, they got $10 million from Trump's tax cuts, and they donated all of that money to organizations fighting climate change. So you can't just say that you're fighting climate change. You can't say that you're environmentalist. You have to actually show it uh, with your dollars. Also, who's on Twitter right now? I need somebody on their phone. I need them to pull up Twitter. I need them to go to Patagonia and give me their bio. Somebody, anybody. Somebody hook me up. <laughs> to, uh, to read Patagonia's bio on Twitter. You know, like, can anybody go to Patagonia's yeah, yeah. Twitter? Okay, what is it? Boom, purpose statement right there. I'm glad they didn't change in the last like 30 minutes. Yeah, so their, <laughs> their purpose statement is right there in their Twitter bio. Um, when Trump reduced the size of two national landmarks in 2017, Patagonia tweeted that, that the president is stealing our land. Now, some other brands, they tweeted that, they probably think, oh, it's just some brand BS. You know, a lot of people don't like brands on the internet. Okay, but when they did it, 50,000 retweets. So people actually really, really believe in Patagonia as an environmentalist brand. And their CEO, Rose Marcario, even said, when we do good things for the environment, we make more money. Yeah. So it's not just purpose, oh, we get more engagements, we get good PR, it's literally, we make more money. So purpose gets you more money. Now, uh, we're talking about bad brands now. The classic is Pepsi with Kendall Jenner. When we saw that, my friends and I, that was actually one of the reasons we kind of wanted to go into this, that that was just such a bad attempt at understanding us. I don't want to roast that. They were trying to do a good thing. They were trying to be social justice oriented. That was all good, but just the way they went about it, you guys have all seen it. I mean, it was just kind of glazed over. Butterflies and rainbows, such an important topic. Uh, and, you know, that just didn't go over well. But so the thing about that is like trying to be woke. Yes, very good thing. Gen Z is obviously very much about that, but it has to be authentic. And again, it didn't really connect with Pepsi's brand message overall like it did with Patagonia. Uh, one more in terms of bad. Here's the thing, Pride Month. A time where all the brands are trying to get involved, and it's a good thing they're all trying to get involved. We have varying degrees of how well they do it. So like Listerine, Chipotle, they kind of just threw rainbows on things, uh, literally just literally threw rainbows on their products and said, LGBTQ uh, month, you know, celebrate. You know, that's not how you do it. Harry's Razors, in contrast, had an ad where they had a trans male with a top scar from surgery uh, shaving, and that showed representation for the community. That showed like an authenticity there. Uh, that really drove that brand purpose home. So um, Pride Month, an opportunity for brands to do well or not so well with our generation. Uh, and yeah. It's kind of s slightly strong POV. And do you, <laughs> don't you love it when he says it's woke? I've got four kids and, and like they're like, it's woke or I'm clapped. I'm like, what are these terms? But anyhow, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So Andrew, um, let me just ask you, because uh, we just heard from Michael, really strong point of view about it, right? What would you say is the biggest difference from your point of view about like a Gen Z perspective versus all the talk you hear about with millennials? Um, I guess, so you're asking about the, the difference between Gen Z and millennials. Um, so I would say three things really. Um, the first, um, you, well you can kind of spell it T-I-P-I. -I. The first um, is truth. We, we want to hear, um, you want to be straight up with us. Um, if, if you're not really, um, communicating with us well, we're going to find a way um, to get that information. So if you're not really shooting us straight, you're not really giving us that information, we're going to find it. You have the internet, you have Google, you can, you can look things up. Um, so if, you, if you're not really transparent, um, we, we just want to hear from you because uh, if, you're not, if you're not really truthful um, with us, we're not going to really uh, trust you back. So um, the second thing um, is individuality. Um, as, as Gen Z, you, you really want to be known as um, you know, your, your own unique um, self. That's, that's really such a big thing with Gen Z. You want to be known as, you're, you're just an individual. You don't just work for a company. You are this person. You, you make an impact. Um, so, especially with social media, um, individuality, you, I, was, I was born into, you know, the Snapchat that, I mean, I wasn't born into it, but I was really, um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Digital name. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, I'm 17 years old and Snapchat wasn't 17 years ago, so. Um, and anyways, um, so with Snapchat, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, Facebook, you can really express yourself on, on those um, platforms. So if, if companies are really looking at hiring you, you're going to look at those profiles. So, so being, such, being an individual on those platforms, um, I mean, you're really going to um, get yourself out there and be known. So, um, and the, and the third, third thing is actually two words. Um, practical innovation. Um, so if you're if you're really um, passionate about something and you want to connect with Gen Z, you need you can't just update or, or innovate 
based on what you and your, your company think, you really have to connect with people and Gen Z. Don't just update or innovate just to innovate. You need, you need to really um, find the purpose and connect with Gen Z, and, you know, whether, whether that's through forms or um, surveys, stuff like that. Um, I, being a 17-year-old, video games are a big thing right now, and um, I know um, moms, dads everywhere are probably not a huge fan of uh, Fortnite. I know all of you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, but the thing is, um, being so connected to that game, um, I guess I would say as a, as a good example, um, Fortnite loves to hear back from their community on what they can do better. They're getting such criticism on you know, not, not updating their game or not, or not uh, you know, switching it up for the fans. So then, so then people were leaving the game and now they just came out with such a big update and completely switched the whole new map and um, really got all of their original players back to the game. So now, now they're, they're being unique. They heard back from their community, you know, because most of the people who play that game are from Gen Z. I know um, there are some millennials out there who play, um, but um, finding your target audience and really mm -hmm. listening to your audience is, is such a big thing. So, um, uh, you know, Andrew, you raise a good point because you're, you're really talking about being inclusive. And I, I was saying to them before, I'm sort of obsessed with this word inclusive capitalism and how capitalism is shifting right now. And so, mm -hmm. Susan, uh, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your purpose journey mm -hmm. and some of the tactics that you put into play um, to help begin to tell Sleep Number's purpose story. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Sleep Number product, but at the core of our product is individuality. We believe, we, one person, maybe two, three, okay, this is better, more people than I thought. God, if you're seeing your ads, so excited. Uh, um, but the, at the core of our product is individuality, this idea that people's sleep experiences are not one size fits all, and so that's why you have your sleep number setting, that's why we have Sleep IQ kind of baked into the bed, it's a smart bed, and have that smart bed technology as core to our product. Um, but this idea of individuality is really at the foundation of our company, and it's, it's internal, um, but it's also external. And so when we actually set out to um, really activate around our mission, which is about helping to improve lives and um, helping to promote quality sleep, we decided that there was a huge opportunity around youth, that there was actually a sleep epidemic um, in that kids were actually missing out on almost a full night of sleep because of all the different things that were kind of pulling on their time. Um, and we sort of sat in a room and established this as our CSR platform um, and recognized very quickly that we didn't understand the why. Um, and none of us in the room could really come up with the reason. Um, and so, you know, we were all like, oh, it's because they're on their phones. It's the Snapchat. It's the Fortnite. Um, and then we were like, you know, we really have to understand from a youth perspective what is driving this. We know that it's impacting them. We, you can look at, you know, anywhere online and, um, and really see the statistics around the both social um, and health consequences of lack of sleep, the increase in depression, the increase in weight gain, and all of the other issues that are related to that. We really felt that sleep was a foundation of that. Um, and so through our partnership with Gen Youth and really our partnership with the NFL as well, um, we were really able to hear from the youth themselves. And so last year, before we announced um, our CSR platform of youth sleep and improving the lives of a million youth by 2025, we actually partnered with Gen Youth um, and Edelman to do a youth survey. So we surveyed youth around the country and said, what do, what do you know about sleep? Do you know that it's important? Um, and found out that yes, they did in fact know that it was important. Yes, they did in fact know that it was impacting every aspect of their life. But the thing that was really interesting to us is that it wasn't because of Fortnite. <laughs> it was because they're working almost 11 and a half hours every single week, um, or sorry, every single day, being in school, coming home and doing homework, having projects, doing after school activities, and getting the input of that youth voice at the very inception of our CSR uh, campaign has been so vital and has been a common thread throughout. So when you talk about you know, being individualized and you talk about being inclusive and, make, and talk about you know, don't, don't be about me without me at the table, we wanted to make sure that what we were doing and how we were targeting youth with this platform 
platform was really incorporating their voice and understanding really what was important to them. And I would just add from our perspective at Gen Youth, uh, one of the things that we had watched is, uh, many of you may be aware of Piper Jaffrey's teen survey and how it can affect stock prices, right? And I'm a Wall Street kid. So I had been looking in that semi-annual teen survey and I said, well, wait a second, like, we reach almost 40 million kids. Why aren't we surveying our own students? Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we had several thousand kids who participate in our programs from 12 to 18 opt in for us to do as many surveys essentially as we wanted to on specific topics and then a control group. And when we sat down and had a conversation with Sleep Number at the very beginning, once again, put our business hat on as a philanthropy. Mm -hmm. If we could help them think of their purpose journey, if we made sure that they heard directly from who they're trying to yeah, impact absolutely. through their purpose. And so when we did that, deployed that survey out to our students across the United States, those ahas like, wow, kids told us they're getting a 1.7 hour deficit mm -hmm. of sleep per night, which means that our kids are going to school five days a week on four nights sleep. Yeah. We learned that through the survey. We also learned through the survey, as Susan just pointed out, that it's not technology and some of the other things that you think, it's that they are overworked and they have no time. So by working together with Sleep Number mm -hmm. and getting these results, then we could deploy a curriculum together with the Alliance for Healthier Generation in school buildings where we could help kids get an opportunity to get more time back and to share Absolutely. back with educators, maybe we should do study hall during the school day because mm -hmm. kids are overworked. There's so many competing influences. I share that with you because they really wanted to hear directly from them as they um, address that, the, that, their purpose. Andrew, um, you've participated in something, one of, our, one of our other programs that we incubated uh, actually from a conversation with Warren Buffett around citizen philanthropy is a program called Adventure Capital. It's a program that we deploy for kids 13 to 18 who want to solve real world problems mm -hmm. and think Shark Tank for kids and we fund their ideas. So we give them an opportunity to create a business plan, communication plan, etc. Andrew participated in our Adventure Capital program, and uh, you were sharing a little bit about it earlier, where essentially he really solved a real-world problem that Landa Lakes is dealing with every single day. Can you speak to that experience? Yeah, so we, um, a few classmates and I, uh, four of us, including myself, um, were, were given an opportunity, um, it was called Hungry for Change, so it was basically um, working, up, working with uh, local businesses to try to um, give access to everyone in the community um, nutritious foods. Um, so we flew out to Philadelphia um, for a challenge um, with four other schools. Um, and our, our solution to that, um, we, we partnered with the Boys and Girls Club of America, um, essentially, in Kewaskum, um, and looked to further expand with, with the grants we are, we are funded with um, to, to uh, you know, the state, the counties, the states, and, and eventually everyone. So. Um, so uh, essentially, there is a, a harvest of the month um, at our local grocery store. I don't know if any of you are from Wisconsin, but Piggly Wiggly. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we, we highlight um, a, a a fruit, a vegetable, or a dairy, um, a whole grain, anything um, nutritious in our in our local grocery store. Um, and those sales, whenever we whenever we um, highlight them, they skyrocket. Um, so we we look to uh, we have a tasting in our schools, um, middle, middle high school and uh, elementary schools. Um, so we have those tastings, and then they are given then to the Boys and Girls Club, um, and they are actually given food vouchers for those unprivileged families who are, who are unable to afford some of these um, nutritious <coughs> foods. So they, we give them food vouchers uh, where they can go pick up those foods and make those recipes at home. Um, so. Yeah, yeah and it's it super cool to experience that. Yeah, and, and so he, he, here he is. He gets an opportunity with his classmates to go to SAP's headquarters where they're rolling up their sleeves. He has four you know, large corporations, including Land Lakes and Corteva AgriScience and Domino's and National Dairy Council and others who are investing in him to hear mm -hmm. what this generation thinks about those real world problems that they're addressing every single day. In the case of Domino's, what do we do with the cardboard boxes? Mm. Um, what, how do we recycle them? What do, you, what do you next generation think we should do about it? Just share that with you because that's in part what we're seeing a lot of partners do around their purpose-driven uh, messaging. Uh, let me just ask you, Michael, you know, 
part of all of this, right, is for folks in the room to figure out how do they connect to you in an authentic way, but also um, what's going to make you want to maybe one day work for them? So the thing is, Gen Z doesn't want to work for you, okay? 41% of us want to be entrepreneurs. So literally, they, the first problem is they don't want to work for you. So how do you make them work for you, okay? <laughs> Uh, 93% of us say that a uh, company's social purpose affects whether they want to work for them or not. So literally almost all of us say social purpose matters for if we want to work for you. So not only does it matter if we want to buy from you, but also work for you. Literally all of us, unless we're being entrepreneurs, which there's going to be a lot of people. So, um, <coughs> so that's very important. Also, uh, you think, okay, well maybe we don't have a great purpose, well maybe we can just pay them a lot. That always works, right? Well, uh, not with our generation either. Very difficult. 74% uh, of us say purpose is more important than paycheck when it comes to who we're working for. Okay, that's more than the three generations before us. So you guys, you guys like your money? Oh my bad, you guys like your money? Okay, we're all about purpose. Okay, it's harder to make us work for you. So the two big things there are, well, I guess the one big thing is actually having a real purpose that Gen Zers can buy into and that'll make you, um, us actually wanna work for you. And then obviously giving us independence in our work to at least give it an entrepreneurial spin if we're not gonna be entrepreneurs um, completely. You're the best. I <laughs> that was good, right? Uh, so, like, oh my God, what do you do with that? Uh, no. Um, so, Susan, let me um, let me let me let me have you follow up on yeah, that, exactly. right? Because I, I, you're going, oh my gosh, <laughs> what am I going to do with sleep number? Is anybody going to come to work for us? Um, but but I think he he raises a really valid yeah. point, which is I think part of defining your purpose is reaching that future consumer. In the case of the Gen Z. And, and part of your hope and goal, right, is not only that they identify with your brand mm -hmm. and that it becomes a love mark relationship, but that you're, you're creating an inclusive environment where they want to work for you. Yeah. What's your reaction when you hear that? Well, I, I'm like, maybe I'm Gen Z. <laughs> because, because I think that's been a really common thread for me as well. And it's one of the things that brought me to Sleep Number. And to that point, it's actually really interesting. We just did our organizational survey. And we, uh, I think 92% of our employees actually connected with the company purpose. And the vendor that helped us execute that survey said that they don't see that high of numbers outside of the healthcare profession. So pharmaceutical companies, people that work for hospitals, they're obviously saving lives. Um, but the idea that we're helping improve lives by um, helping people understand sleep and creating a product that's really meaningful with our 360 smart bed is something that attracts people to sleep number and has helped with retention as well. Um, but I think the, the, the part that I love that, about what he's saying is um, this idea of creating an opportunity for people to be entrepreneurial, whether in, you know, within the company or outside. And we've tapped into that even with our partnership with Gen Youth. Um, one of the ways we're, we're you know, not necessarily recruiting, but we're working in, in our next phase of our program, we're actually going to be um, creating sleep advocates that are going to be going to the school. So not the, you know, us going into the school and being like, eat your vegetables, sleep eight hours, and do whatever, but really leveraging that youth voice and giving them the power to go back and talk to their peers and to their classmates and say, hey, here's what I learned. It's helping me level up. It's helping to step up my game in every single aspect of my life. And here's how you can do that as well and really arming um, you know, great leaders like Andrew with that information so that they can go back and really be advocates um, for, their, for their peers. Um, let's, if, it, if we can, open it up to questions, because I'm sure there are some folks in the audience who want to um, ask the experts here directly. So there are mic runners. So if anybody has a question, just uh, you know, raise your hand. Uh, OK, right here in the corner. Um, my question is for Andrew and Michael. So as youth who are making purchasing decisions and you know learning about brands, purposes, and, and things like that, um, you know, as as communications professionals, we think a lot about when does the message come from the brand? When does it come from influencers, whether big or small? Um, what do you feel is most, what resonates with you the most when you hear about a brand's purpose? Is that when it comes from the brand? Is it when it comes from um, you know, a, a celebrity that you look up to? Does it come from your friends? Like, What is most, most authentic to you? Um, I think actually, um, the first thing is definitely coming from the brand, um, because if you're not hearing from the first hand, like mm -hmm. the first source, um, then it's kind of, um, I wouldn't say it, it's definitely not meaningless, because 
Um, hearing from anyone else is, is really good as well, but hearing directly from the brand, and if you're getting that mission statement from the brand and, and it's following um, like your product line, um, that's, that's really meaningful, um, for me at least. Um, and then, obviously, with a celebrity, um, big Milwaukee Bucks fan, NBA, um, I love Giannis Antetokounmpo. He's, he's our star player, um, and, he, and he partnered with Hulu. Um, and I didn't really know kind of like what Hulu's like guidelines were, what, what they were really all about. I knew it was all like Netflix at this time, but then, but then you get so many more people starting to, to look at Hulu and kind of like what they're doing. So getting those celebrities, um, kind of, you don't really need to um, get every single celebrity, but, but getting um, that partnership and, and marketing um, with, that, with that person is, is really important. What, and, and I just tell you one thing when we were talking earlier that Andrew said when we were, we were uh, in the back, he said, um, what works for them works for me. Mm. I was like, wow. You know, if you think about it, you know, that's pretty remarkable. If it's someone they look up to, and I find that with my kids too, but I just thought that was so smart. Mm -hmm. and can I, can I yes, go for it. Okay, so obviously it has to come from the top down. It has to be from the brand originally, uh, like Andrew was saying, but the brand, again, um, can't just be talking. It has to actually be doing. Uh, so putting their money where their out mouth is and actually doing things. Obviously, you guys have heard a lot about influencers. Influencers are crucial, but what people don't talk about is it can't just be any random influencer with any random product. Like if Shaq is selling car insurance, I don't really care because why is he selling car insurance? I mean, he's, he's cool, but like there's, a, there's no connection there. There has to be a real authentic connection, just like with brands and their purpose, there has to be an authentic connection um, with influencers and what they're selling. For example, mm -hmm. I saw an ad on TikTok, by the way, you guys should be on that. Uh, Brad Rivera, uh, uh, an influencer, he was from Vine. He's kind of with like the younger generation, kind of like a, a cutesy, uh, like he does like cute, thing, cute funny things on Vine and uh, TikTok. Uh, he was doing like a funny dance for Chipotle, for uh, guacamole. All right, so you might think like, okay, so what does he have to do with, with guacamole, with Chipotle? Well, he made it work for him. So he made it with this goofy dance, like this guacamole song, right? So you're giving influencers a chance to make it um, part of them yeah. and to make it authentic in their content. So it's not just, hey, buy this thing. It's like, obviously people know it's an ad, but if they say, oh, I like that influencer, clearly he, he or she actually likes that product. They're not just selling something to me. Uh, we feel an authentic connection from them as like a peer-to-peer -peer type thing. Uh, so if it was Jay Leno, because he has like a thousand cars, maybe he would have been better than Shaq for the car insurance one. Um, but uh, the TikTok thing, it's really funny. I, I see you smiling there. Uh, my seven-year-old daughter taught me what TikTok is. And now my three boys in the house are using TikTok because of my seven-year-old daughter. Like, that's, that's scary, okay? Like, and she's on it like all the time. So, I mean, they're, that's all they're talking about now. <laughs> it's like, moving on. Um, okay, another question. Any other questions? In, in, oh, sorry, right there. Michael, and I'm really curious about data privacy, right? You said you grew up with Snapchat. So the bed knows how you sleep and how you perform in the future. Um, <laughs> you talk about TikTok. It's a Chinese-owned company. I'm Indian. It's a Chinese-owned company with regulation on free speech. You on purpose. You want free speech, you want rights, you want equality. As someone who's got young kids and is equally conscious and tries to calibrate this, you're not representative for the every, every Gen Z individual, but I'm curious of how you personally wrestle mm. with the data privacy and the choices you're making. Are you conscious of the choices with TikTok, mm. for example, okay, okay, we'll see, yeah. uh, as a platform? Is that for me? Yeah. Go for okay. it. You start. Go ahead. Was that Go ahead. Point? Yeah, okay, me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so you're asking about data privacy versus like being authentic on the platform? So yeah, the basically like how do you feel about the fact that the things you're interacting with are capturing all this data and they're going to mm. know everything and anything about you? Okay, when you put it like that, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's They do! Not, it's not like great that they're going to know everything about us. Uh, but you know, targeted ads are good. This is kind of a hard question. Okay, well, <laughs> look, this is just how we are. Uh, people are going to be on these platforms. This is how we connect with each other. Um, it's not great that they're going to know everything about us, but especially with TikTok, uh, what we've seen there is people are feeling, a like, big thing on social media is obviously you've seen with Instagram, and there's also like Finstas, which are like your real, your fun Instagram, like your real Instagram, which doesn't make any sense because your Instagram should be a real Instagram. Why do you have a fake Instagram? Doesn't, what, like, what is that? Their parents, so, obviously. Yeah, it's weird. Like, oh, you want to hide, yeah, you hide it from people. But things with TikTok, we're seeing a lot more authenticity and vulnerability on it because uh, frankly, the old people haven't gotten into it yet. And you know, it's not there for like, you know, peop uh, jobs to check in and stuff. So you see kids actually being themselves on that platform, and that's a reason why TikTok has been growing so much. 
Yeah, I I, create, I completely agree. Um, with Tic Tac, you're you're really seeing people's like true colors, I guess. They're really show, expressing themselves, and um, I guess more on Instagram, it's more like, oh, my feed needs to be perfect. Like I need to have the perfect picture, the perfect caption, the perfect everything. Where on Tic Tac, you're more of just like a, you're more of, I guess your true self. You're not you're not really, you don't really care what people think on Tic Tac. You're more of just you know authentic. videos and yeah, authentic for sure. Thank you guys so much. I think our, our time is up, and thank you guys for the questions. And Stephen, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you.